This guy here was a guy called Bobby Leach. He was one of those guys who seemed to thrive on danger. He was born in Lancaster in England, and, but went in, in 1858. But he went to America when he was 18 years old. He began his career doing trick swimming and diving exhibitions. But then he moved on to Bar- the Barnum and Bailey Circus, performing high diving feats. Then in 1908, he made a parachute jump from a bridge, the Steel Arch Bridge, over Niagara, from a height of over 200 feet, or 60 meters. But that wasn't dangerous enough for Bobby. So in 1911, he climbed into this steel barrel, and he went over the Niagara Falls. He broke his jaw, both of his kneecaps, but he survived. And it became only the second person ever to survive going over Niagara Falls. But then years later, in 1926, he was on a lecture tour in New Zealand. He was walking down the street and he slipped on an orange peel. As a result, he broke his leg. It became infected. He got amputated. But then two months later, as a result of complications, he died. After surviving all of these incredible feats, it's ridiculous that it was an orange peel that was his downfall. And I think that's often like in our Christian lives. It's not always the big temptations that cause us to fall. It's not always those big things that people think about that are most dangerous in our lives. We can often see those those temptations from afar and we can prepare ourselves and get ready to overcome them. Rather, it's often the small, the insignificant, the, the daily incidents that cause our downfall, that lead us away from our faith in Christ and our commitment to Him. Things that we're not looking out for, that we're not prepared for, that we don't realize just how vulnerable we are to them. But it doesn't need to be like that. In his pattern for prayer, Jesus taught us to pray to our Heavenly Father, both to express humbly how vulnerable we are to temptation, but also to ask for the strength to be victorious over those temptations. So we're going to read uh, for the last time as we've gone through this little series on Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 9 down to verse 13 and Jude is going to come and he's going to read for us. Thanks Jude. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be in your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Judith. Two weeks ago, if you were with us, we were rejoicing in the amazing truth that because of God's gift of forgiveness... We don't need to allow our ongoing struggle with sin to stop us from experiencing closeness with our Heavenly Father. Through prayer, Jesus encouraged us to confess our sins to God, knowing that He will forgive us completely. Because His grace is sufficient for us. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But Jesus wants to do more than just forgive our sins. He also wants to help us to be victorious over them. Yes, we know that the war on sin will not be won until we get to heaven. But Jesus wants us to give us victory in some of those battles right now. He wants to change our lives. And so in this last section, 
He encouraged us to pray two things. For direction and for protection. First of all, we're to pray, lead us not into temptation. God is the one who has the right to lead us in our lives. And it's our responsibility, of course, to follow his leadership. This follows from what Jesus has already taught us to pray. If you remember, in verse 10, your kingdom come, we're called to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we're praying that, then it's right for us to pray to God, to ask Him to lead us in our lives so that we can more fully live under His rule and under His reign. So that we can more fully fulfill His will for our lives. So we're called to follow His leadership. This was, of course, the the, the basic call that Jesus gave to those Uh, who he was calling to be part of his family. His words were, come, follow me. We're not ultimately called to follow a set of rules in our Christian lives. Christianity is not just about following a system of doctrine. It's not even a a step-by-step guide to how we should live our lives. It's not just a way of life, like a lifestyle choice. Instead, we're called to follow a person. To allow Jesus to lead us. To direct us. To show us the right way to go in every aspect of our lives. We're called to follow Jesus. Because Jesus is our good shepherd. He leads out in front of us. And we have to put our trust in him. And follow him in every aspect of our lives. This is what what Jesus said in John chapter 10. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. That's what it means to be a disciple. It's about following Jesus because we believe that his plan for our lives is the best. There's nothing better. Than following Jesus. And so it's right and proper that we pray for God to lead us. Psalm 25 says this, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. Of course, we pray for God to lead us in our lives, to give us that direction in which we should go. But why should we pray for God to lead us not into temptation? Surely, that's a really strange thing to ask when you think of it. Because why would our loving Heavenly Father ever lead us into temptation? Well, I think to understand that, we need to think about what that word temptation really means. What the original word that is translated in our Bibles, temptation, really means. So, yes, it can refer to a temptation, like an enticement to evil. Like when Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, if you remember, they were lured to to rebel against God by the serpent. That that they were tempted. And we all face temptation from a whole variety of different sources. But the Bible is clear that God will not tempt His children. He will not entice us to evil. James 1 says this, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anybody. But we also need to remember that being tempted is not the same as committing sin. Temptation only becomes sinful if we yield to it, if we give in to it. 
When we allow that temptation to lead us into words or actions or thoughts or attitudes that are against God. To be tempted is not to be wrong. We can be tempted and yet overcome that temptation. That's what Jesus did every single time in his life. Jesus was tempted in every way. Just as we are. Yet was without sin. He was tempted in all the whole range of ways that we are tempted. And yet, every single time, he refused to say or do or think anything that was against his father's will. And when we are tested in this way, and when we overcome that test like Jesus did, That can help us to grow in our faith. That's what James also wrote in James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So this word temptation doesn't always mean enticement to evil. It can also mean that test or trial that we face. It's when we're brought into a difficult circumstance that tests our faithfulness to God. And those tests can be good for us. Jason was sharing about this last week. How God's purpose for those trials, for those tests, is not to entice us to evil. It's not to pull us away from God. Of course it's not. But it's to strengthen us in our faith. So that we deepen our commitment to Him. And we continue to walk in His ways. So the same situation in our lives can produce those two different results. If we face that test in our own strength and we follow the desires of our own sinful nature, then we'll fall into sin. And we'll experience a distance from God. A growing distance from God. But if we submit to God in that very same situation, and we trust Him in the middle of that of it, then He can all help us to overcome that test. And as a result, we will grow in our faith. And grow in our closeness to God. Same situation... Two different results. So what are we saying when we ask, God, lead us not into temptation? Well, I think it's a prayer of humility. Yes, we know at times that the Father, He leads us into times of testing for our good, so that we can grow in our faith and commitment to Christ. But we also know that we're weak. We also know that we can't handle every situation. We know that we can't resist every temptation. And so this is a prayer that humbly asks, Lord, don't ever lead us into a trial that will be too much for us. Father, don't put us into a situation that we can't handle. Keep us close to you. Keep us depending on you. Keep us safe. It's a prayer of humility in which we recognize our own vulnerability to temptation. Paul warned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, sorry, chapter 10, verse 12, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. The most dangerous attitude for us as believers is for us to be proud. To be self-confident. To think that we can stand no matter what. Oh, we won't fall. Look at that person. They're they're struggling, but I'll never do that. That kind of attitude is going to lead to disaster in our lives. 
But this prayer encourages us to keep on coming back to God in the humility of recognizing that we are weak, that we are vulnerable, and we need God's help to lead us away from the temptations that we can't resist. And the great thing is that we can pray this prayer with confidence. Because God has promised to do exactly this. The very next verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says this. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Did you get that? What an amazing promise. The temptations that we face are are not unique to you or to me. They're common. We all struggle. Do you get that? We all struggle. If you're sitting here thinking about, you don't know what I struggle with, well, we all struggle. They're common. Lead us into, not into temptation is a family prayer for all of us to pray that regularly in our lives because we all need this help. But this verse also reminds us that God won't help, won't allow us to be tempted beyond our ability to bear. We never need to say, I just had to give in. I couldn't help it. There was no other way for it, but I just had to sin. We never need to say that as a believer in Jesus. Because God, whatever temptation we face, He is faithful with us. He'll stick by us no matter what we face. And He'll provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. If we depend on Him, then He will help us to be victorious over the temptations in our lives. Do we get that, guys? Because I know, I, I, I know in, in our minds we're going to be thinking, I, I, no, no, I can't do that. This thing that I've been struggling with for years, that's always going to win in my life. But God says otherwise. He says that if we depend on Him, we can be victorious. We can overcome. We don't need to be held in slavery to that sin for the rest of our lives. He is a rescuer, as we're thinking about this morning in in our songs. But we need to be honest here. We can only really pray this genuinely if we're willing to take those ways out that God provides. Stories told that a man went to the doctor complaining that he'd broken his arm in two places. The doctor's reply was, well then stay out of those two places. And in this prayer, we also express that commitment to stay out of the places where we know that we're going to be tempted. It would really make no sense to be asking God, God, lead us not into temptation if we are running headlong into those places of temptation in our lives. Like Timothy was told by Paul, we need to flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. As we pray, lead us not into temptation, we need to be running to Jesus. To following him. But there's a second part to praying about being vulnerable yet victorious. Not only lead us not into into temptation, but secondly, deliver us from the evil one. There's some debate over what this, this, this verse actually means, the translation of it. So some translations of a Bible, maybe maybe the one you have in your hand, says, deliver us from evil. Just in general, evil. Every kind of evil. 
And that would include all of the evil and the corruption of, in the people of this world. Paul asked that the Thessalonians would pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. And I don't think we need to be convinced of the need for that. If you, if you read the, the, the news headlines or watch the news every, every day, you see the evidence, the proof of the reality that people around us are evil. Wars, murders, assaults, robberies, scams. The list just goes on and on and on. There are so many evil people around. And there are also many everyday things that happen that they wouldn't get in the, in the news, but they still really hurt us. When people tell lies about us. When they pass on gossip. When their, their selfishness and their self-centeredness really impacts our lives. But in this evil world, it's great that we can come to our Heavenly Father and ask Him to deliver us from evil. Psalm 18 says this, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And I am saved from my enemies. What a wonderful prayer we can pray. Not that, as we saw last week, not that that means that that nothing bad will happen to us. But it means that even in the face of all of the evil that we see in people around us, we know that they can hurt us, we can suffer harm, but ultimately, ultimately, they can't really harm us. Because nothing and no one can ever separate us from our loving Heavenly Father. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We can pray, deliver us from evil in the people around us. But we can also pray, deliver us from the evil in ourselves. These days, I don't know if you've heard, I've heard so many people say this, or you should just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Do whatever feels right to you. But I think hopefully we know that's disastrous advice. Absolute disastrous, because the Bible says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? We mustn't follow our heart because it's dishonest, it's wicked. It will lead us down certain paths that we think and feel are right for us, but in the end they'll lead to death. Promises significance and security and satisfaction, but it deceives us. It's a scam. Those, those desires will lead us into selfishness and self-centeredness and sinful and destructive behaviours. So Proverbs 14 says, there's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it leads to death. So we mustn't follow our hearts. Instead, we need to be delivered from them. We need to ask God to set us free from our selfish desires. From the slavery to our own sinful heart. And the great news is that's what Jesus has provided for us when he went to the cross to die for us. And each day we can come to God and ask him to continue the process of setting us free from that. To help us to step into the reality of what Jesus has done for us. As we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 
we can pray that our Father would continue that process of sanctification, making us more like Jesus, delivering us from slavery to sin, so that we can live more and more in the joy and the freedom of knowing Jesus. Deliver us from the evil in others. Deliver us from the evil in ourselves. But the NIV, and maybe your own translation you have there, translates this verse, deliver us from the evil one. We need deliverance ultimately from the evil one, the devil, our ultimate enemy. The Bible is really clear that he is very real and very dangerous. Paul wrote that your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's out to destroy us and our potential for living for God and glorifying his name. And one of the main ways that he does this is through deception, through telling us lies. He is the father of lies, Jesus said. He's the ultimate source of lies that lead us away from God's will. But we can pray for God to deliver us from those attacks. This is actually what Jesus prayed for. On the night before he went to the cross, he prayed for us. This is what he said. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So we can pray with confidence for this deliverance. Because the reality is that if we cling to God, we have nothing to fear. James again wrote about this in James chapter 4. He said this, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Yes, we need to be aware of the devil's attacks. We need to understand his strategies. We need to see through his lies. But if we submit to God, We can stand against him. And it's him who will flee from us. What an incredible thought. That's because although our enemy is a dangerous enemy, he's also a defeated enemy. When Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross, he defeated all of the forces of evil. This wonderful verse in Colossians chapter 2. And having disarmed the powers and authority, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so if we've trusted in Jesus, then one day we will fully enter into Jesus' victory over the devil. And until that time, we can be sure, we can be certain that Jesus will keep us safe. Because as John said, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. God is greater. So we don't need to be afraid. Yes, the devil is our very real enemy. Yes, he is out to destroy our lives. But we are held in our Father's hand. He'll never let us go. And we can rest secure in that knowledge. So our lives do not need to end in failure. We are vulnerable to those attacks of the evil one, yes. But we can pray, deliver us from the evil one. Because Jesus has already defeated him. By dying on the cross. And he invites us to share in his victory. So folks, these are just some of the things that we can learn 
from Jesus' pattern for his prayer. We've all looked at it over the last five weeks or so. And Jesus has said, this then is how you should pray. It's about a relationship, not a performance. It's about being God-centered, not self-centered. It's about being dependent on God, not independent from Him. It's about being forgiven and forgiving. And it's about being vulnerable, but being victorious. What an incredible privilege we have to come before our Heavenly Father. So let's not miss out on this gift. Let's not be distracted from it. Instead, let's be committed to praying as Jesus taught us to.